Hi, everyone. I'm Stefan. I'm Stephanie. <laughs> Welcome to the Access California podcast part three. I think this is part three of our three part uh, designation. Thank yes. you for being here with our in our podcast. If you'll today. notice, I'm not Claire, but I'll try to be a good substitute today. It's doing so well so far. I think we've had a lot of fun and had some really great conversations. Uh, so thanks for being here. When I was when I first started like working in direct service, I worked in domestic violence, and I you know I I grew up in a lot of violence, both as a, a as a victim, but also a witness of a lot of you know domestic violence between my my parents, and so I'm thinking, gosh, I'm gonna save all of the women and children of the world, <laughs> and that is how I'm gonna save myself. Yes, and you know so easily did I fall down these like you know sort of rescuer mentality mm -hmm. uh, to the point where, um, you know, I get really frustrated if, like, let's say an abused person goes back to their abuser. You're like, what is wrong with you? Like, how did, you know, you just lost you your kids. You were a frenzied and you savior. Just got yeah, yeah, yeah frenzied I was. Savior. I was. Uh. Uh, I followed people down into their spirals, and that was, like, the thing that I had to learn how to not do was not to follow people down their story, Right. Like, I can be there with them as they experience, but I can't trip and fall into it, um, which is, like, that's, like, a learned skill. It takes a lot of years. It takes it takes some compassion fatigue. It takes some jadedness. It takes stepping away because you can't have capacity. And then it, and it also, you know, it takes, like, I, I'm, I'm hard-headed. I had to learn by, by trial and error, you know, Trainings are, are great until you experience it and then your emotions are involved and then you're pulled before you have the, the, the brain capacity to follow. Um, and, and that was, you know, I learned a lot of lessons then. I learned so many lessons. I'd go to court and, uh, you know, I'd be in court, you know, as, as the, the legal advocate going with, you know, uh, and we're not supposed to say anything. We're just there to, like, comfort and things like that. And they, you know, once they started letting me up at the bench, it was like, it was like game over. <laughs> Suddenly I was the secondary lawyer because at the time I was, I was studying more legal things. Um, I was thinking that I wanted to be a paralegal. So I was, you know, trying to remember all of these statutes and things. And, uh, but I would get so emotional because, you know, these, these abusers would, look right at you know these women and taunt them like silently you know and then of course once i'd stand up and we're out in the waiting area then they'd be like what the hell is this is this guy a lawyer or is he a bodyguard which one is it you know but you know i took that i took that role very seriously um and i think it's easy to fall into those spaces when you're seeing somebody stumble i think one of the things that i almost want to say set me free um was when at Cal Voices, we started creating the curriculum for peer trainings. Oh, because, okay. like I said, like I had had trainings here and there, but it was never like a full comprehensive, like everything you need to know going into this. And let's, pro let's process some of your stuff through activities and things in, your, in the training. And um, one of the things that I do really feel set me free was really understanding like Sam's definition of recovery. That was a big one for me because, and I, I know I'm going to botch it, so forgive me, but it's like recovery is, um, oh gosh, I'm embarrassed. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's like managing, like making their own choices, living a self-directed life, mm -hmm. striving to reach their full potential. Like those are all parts of the definition. And like one of the things I think it, I, that I was able to recognize especially that definition was self-directed life that that was mm -hmm. part of the definition of recovery was living a self-directed life and it really was humbling for me because I realized I had been directing my siblings life and how was she going to be in recovery if she wasn't able to direct her own life um, and that was very, like I said, very humbling for me because it was like I was meeting all of my own needs because I'm worried, I'm scared, I'm nervous, I'm terrified, I need this to work, and I'm the oldest. And we had some, you know, family dynamics growing up. So yeah. I was used to being the, like, 
the rescuer. Oh. I was I was in that role at a young age. Like that's what I was used to. And so the little parents. When my yeah, when my um when my sibling became unwell, that was like my go-to was like, I have to take charge of this situation because I don't know what's going to happen. And I think over time it was the rescuing, the saving, the intervening with everything. And, and because I was meeting my own need and I was directing her life or my parents were directing her life, she didn't learn how to direct her own life. So, so she became dependent. She didn't know how to advocate for herself. She mm-hmm. didn't know how to like call social security. She didn't know how to like make her own resume. She didn't, there were so many things that she had not built the skill to do because we were doing it for her. Um, and so, and, and we think about like when people develop mental health challenges, it's adolescent and young adulthood. And those are the times yeah. that you are in junior high, high school, you're navigating difficult relationships. You're yeah. like learning how to deal with like conflict resolution. You're learning how to socialize. You're learning social norms. You're, you know, I mean like there's so many things that, so many skills you develop at that age that we don't think about. And when people become unwell during that period of time, there can be a lot of like social emotional development that that people get behind on or don't get an opportunity to engage in because yeah. they're unwell and or everybody around them is making those decisions. And so that's true. That was really helpful for me. Um, and then also nonviolent communication. Like I will preach nonviolent communication that book? everywhere. Is it the book? It's a, that? Yeah, they have a they have a, a book. Think- it's called <laughs> Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg. There's an old version on the internet that's free, um, but the most recent version it's like ten bucks on Amazon. It's a really easy read. I, I think, think I have it. I think, I think the think- audio book is free. Yeah. Um, and it really like put it in perspective for me. Right? Like I am super anxious right now. Why am I anxious? Oh, I'm anxious because I have a need for safety, consistency, predictability. Like I have all these needs and those needs are not being met right now. So I have a ton of anxiety. Hmm. And so I would do things to meet that need that then created unmet needs in other people around me. Oh. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so familiar? It perpetuates, yeah. Yeah, and then it's yeah. like, okay, so now my sibling has a need for autonomy, for independence, for expression, for all these things because my me meeting my need created unmet needs in her. Um, mm-hmm. And so it was like, it helped me like when I had these intense feelings of like to kind of step back and be like, uh, what's my need right now? Just to like take the edge off and be able to look and also be like, I'm about to do this. Whose need am I meeting? Am I meeting my need right now? And if I'm trying to meet my need, can I like do something about my need to say, hey, I'll get to you in a second and like yeah. deal with the need at hand. And so I think those two things really like freed me and in some ways I want to say freed my sibling because yeah. <laughs> I like I was able to like step back and be like if something happens to me what are you going to do because I literally created this situation where you're dependent on me and then something happens to me and I basically harmed you by just not having good boundaries you know I, I was th- when, as you were talking about this I was thinking about like being somebody who was going from not in recovery to recovery like the idea of having a self-directed life, even though that might be kind of like a hope, like the idea of it is so daunting. Like it's so fear like creating. You're like because, I'm wait, I'm responsible for me and everything I do. Well, in that, <laughs> and how do I get from where I feel now yeah. where I don't want to get out of bed? I don't want to take a shower. I barely want to like, you know, do anything. Like, I don't mm-hmm. want to feed my pets. Mm-hmm. I don't want to water my plants. Mm-hmm. How do I go from that, that feeling, that weighted feeling of, of not wanting to do those things to this far distant land of not only being able to do it, but being able to do it well and independent and autonomous and having a, a sense of purpose and support. Like it's a, it's it, it, like when I, when I first, when I first got sober was when I first started working on my, my mental health. Um, and the idea that I had two things to work on, they felt incredibly separate, like one probably created the other and then exacerbated the other. Right. And I was in this, this cycle for years and this idea that I, that I was responsible for it was, was wild to me because it's like, well, nobody modeled this for me. Nobody showed me how to do this. Like I learned how to play the saxophone and 
the recorder and I never knew how to pay taxes or cook for myself or anything else. And now you're telling me I have to not only navigate getting sober, but I have to suddenly be mentally well, you know? And, and, and so like, even as you're describing this and you're talking about the Sam's definition and the, the concept of self-directed life, I like in myself just felt like, Oh my gosh, like that, that is so hard. That is a hard achievement. And it's because like nobody models, it's that, you, you know, people love fishing for you, right? Nobody teaches yeah, you how to fish no, anymore. That takes longer. Because it takes longer and I've it takes- time for that. Yeah, no, not at all. But here, let me just give you a fish. Well, Do you want it fried? I know. Like, <laughs> well, there, so there's a few things that like, as you're talking are coming up for me is like one, like, I think that as a family member, like I learned, and I use this analogy in training. So if anybody's been in a training with me, sorry. Um, but- <laughs> I'm, I make a really good GPS system now. Jeez. So like, I know where we are and I know where recovery is Yeah. and I know the way there's a lot of ways, but there's a lot of ways. Right. So I can be like, Hey, up there at the light, make a left. Well, guess what? It's your recovery. So you might make a right. Mm, and I if see. you make a right, does your GPS grab the steering wheel and yell at you? What's your GPS do? Just redirection. Rerouting, yeah. rerouting, right? And so I'm like, oh, great, make a U-turn. Let's take the scenic route. Yeah. I'm still going to help you get you there, right? Regardless. So I think as a supporter, as a peer, as like all of that, it's like people can have their own self-directed life. They can drive the car themselves. And I'm over in the passenger seat being, do you want to make a left up there? You know, choice it might yours. be a shortcut, but hey, it, the choice is yours. It's your recovery. So yeah. I think that like helps me sometimes to kind of step back and be like, I'm not useless. Like I still can be very, very helpful, but I can't like do this for everybody. Yeah. Um, and you know, and I think kind of what you're saying was like getting from where I am now to this like light at the end of the tunnel is an overwhelming thing to think about. Right. And so I think that's where peer support comes in Yeah. because as a peer, I can model what that looks like. I can model that it's possible. Um, and I can also validate how you're feeling right now. Right. And so like for you on your side, you're like, oh, my own recovery, how I get to, to the light at the end of the tunnel. And like on my end, it's like supporting the family members. Like, no, there is a light at the end of the tunnel like, yeah. and showing people that that exists and that they can do it. And like, here's what worked for me that might not work for you, but I'm a great GPS system. So I can yeah. help kind of like figure that out along the way. It's that, the hope. That's pretty neat. It is the hope. And like, you know, even even the people who feel the most powerless or like, you know, the most hopeless. Like, I think, you know, even just like being able to be aware of like, you know what, I can't get out of bed today. I don't really want to talk to anyone. I just want to mm -hmm. go back to sleep and hope that it's better, right? Those little tiny like, like, you know, splinters of hope become something so much more like palatable when they, when, when like we see others that are also experiencing it. One of the things that I was talking about earlier today in the training um, you know, they were talking about group facilitation and, and like the importance of group facilitation and, you know, sure there's connection and there's relatability. But one of the things that was really important to me, um, when I had done group work as a, as a participant was that as everybody was sharing these, these things, I found my voice to actually share something too, when I really, really didn't want to. I didn't want anybody to know anything about yeah. me. I didn't want um, anything, anything that I could possibly say to be carried beyond the room mm -hmm. um, of, of in the safe container of that group. All of those things were like, you know, hard pressed, if, like ideas that I had. But the more and more I heard other people's voices, I realized that I could maybe have one. And then it could be like, well, actually, I could maybe have a louder voice. And then it became, I could have a voice. And then it became, I have a voice. And then it became, how do I speak up, you know? And like, and, 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 and kind of to that tunnel, I think that's really just kind of, that is the recovery process in general. But um, yeah, like I, I think, I think overall having, having a life that is self-directed is, is a complete triumph, right? But I think getting there and moving towards that, like building building hope off of small successes, like is, is probably more of a triumph than anything. You know, I think there's a lot of power in the process rather than just, I mean, I guess there's no true, you know, final destination, right? It's always, it's always working. Well, and now I'm remembering the definition, but it starts with a process of change. 
Oh, right? that's, that's right. what recovery starts with. A process, <laughs> a of, process change of change through which individuals live a self-directed life. Something, something, something. And strive to reach their full potential, right? So it's, um, I think that's also like very freeing for people as well. Is like, it's a process. Like you're not going to get there tomorrow and that's okay. Yeah. Which is, I mean, it's scary on both sides. Like, it's like, okay, great. I won't be there tomorrow. But also like, damn, I won't be there tomorrow. Yeah. So, and like all the work that goes into that. And that's why we always say like, it is so courageous when people actually seek out like recovery. What No matter yeah. what that looks like for them. Yeah. Like it is very courageous because like you were saying, like, you know, you're afraid of being vulnerable because being vulnerable, vulnerable can sometimes be dangerous. Yeah. Right. It can be used against me. It could be used as a weapon against me. And like, I don't want to put myself in that situation, especially if I have a history of not being able to trust people. Yeah. Vulnerability and, equals danger. Vulnerability equals harm. Well, and depending on what community culture you're from, it can it mean can that. Be. Absolutely. Yeah, and absolutely. so it's like, I think that it's, it's very deeply and rooted in many different cultures. Like we don't talk about, oh, we don't talk about this outside our house. Oh, and by the way, we don't even talk in our house about it. That's right. Yeah. Um, and so it's, but it, it's often out of safety. That's how it, like that came about. But now it's like, I think, especially when people are struggling, it's very harmful. And so how do you like balance that? Yeah, the culture, I, you know, thinking about cultural implications, we didn't talk, you know, you know, as an adult in reflection, right? I can see that, you know, there were people with substance use challenges, right? Mm -hmm. You know, substance abuse addictions, and uh, there were certainly, you know, mental illness in my in my mm -hmm. in my family. Um, at one point in time, I called this, you know, my own mental illness and substance use the family inheritance because I got sort of best of both of of what I would see in my family, and it would just really kind of be talked about of like, oh yeah, we don't we don't really talk about that, or oh no. You know, your uncle's just having a hard time today. He'll be mm -hmm. fine tomorrow. Don't worry about it. Don't bring it up to anyone, right? Or, like, even when I first went to – my first therapy was in high school because I was a very, you know, a very challenged kid. Uh, you know, I came back home my very first day, and my parents were very much like, what are you telling this person? Why are you telling them anything? I want to know what you're saying. I want to go to that, you know. And, you know, there's a lot of protection there of, of like, keeping this appearance of, mm -hmm. a, of a whole family um, and, a, and a well family, uh, keeping that appearance intact. And, um, and I, I think that was, like, a really big thing. And, and only now, within the last five to ten years, has my family, my greater family, really started to address their individual issues mm -hmm. um, because it's become more socially okay Right. Well, and I think also, like, if you look back, like, look at history, like, our systems have harmed our communities. And so yeah. it's not a, like, this, like, made up fear or worry. Like, it is, it's based in history. Like, this has happened. And so I think it, it you know, with, with mental health and substance use challenges, I think just our society has gotten to where we talk about more, it more and are open to talking about it and are encouraged to talk about it. And so... Yeah. I mean, I think just like at the, the light at the end of the tunnel, right? It takes time and transformation and growth and safety and all these things for us to get to a point where we can talk about it. And it's just, it's, it can be hard still. And, and safety is huge. I mean, I was, I was writing a paper uh, the, other, the other day and it was, uh, I came across the, the Tuskegee experiments, mm -hmm. right? Which are, you know, horrible, horrible piece mm -hmm. of, of African-American history as it relates to, you know, medical model and systems and things like that. And I know that, like, even in myself, I'm, I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, there have been times where I would be sick and I'm not going to the ER, not mm -hmm. at all. Like, I'm not going to the ER unless I absolutely have to because, like, I know that uh, I'm going to have to deal with this, 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 and this before I get the same amount of care that someone who doesn't look like right. me gets. I, uh, in 2020, during COVID, I sneezed and I bursted my Adam's apple, split it in half. It's a thing. Um, <laughs> and uh, they held me from operating because they wanted me to take a polygraph because they were convinced that I was actually in a domestically violent uh, relationship and that I was either abusing or being abused. And it wasn't until a friend of mine actually had to call and report the surgeon that they were like, Oh, no, 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 we were just kidding. We're going to actually go ahead and do it. 
Um, and I think by that time I had been in the ICU for like two days. Well, which is know? wild because it's like you need that done either way. Yeah. No, whether no matter why, <laughs> whether you got like smacked in the throat or whatever, like you, it was going to need to happen. Like, why yeah. are you going to postpone that? Like, figure right. it out later. Yeah. No. And it was weird. I mean, I had I had oxygen bubbles going into like the crevices, you know, in yeah. my cranium, and and they were like, oh yeah, this is not this is not good. We need to do something about this. And and yeah, sure enough, you know, we had a we had a. A surgeon come down from Roseville and she's like, I don't really believe you. Like, we're going to do a polygraph. And uh, my first thought is, why do you have a polygraph right. in ICU? <laughs> <laughs> There's a problem here. Oh, Let's start hmm. there. <laughs> um, and so, you know, even even if they were joking as an experience, when you have a hole in your throat, you're, you know, it, 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 it's like, well, why did I come here? I yeah. could have just put a Band-Aid on it and went home and I right. would have felt safer. And I it, and I think, I think when you have these kind of like these things that have historically happened, and then you sort of experience things that may not exactly be the same, but kind of in that same realm of feeling, you know, it, it makes wanting to to do things like recovery uh, really un, it, it's it's a leap, it's a leap of 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 faith, and it's a leap of belief, um, and. Uh, and I know, I know for me, 10 years ago, I would have never said that, like, I'm going to go uh, and do therapy or group therapy. I'm not going to take any sort of pharmaceutical interventions. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't, and I was talking to Claire about this, if it wasn't f the, for the fact that when I went into the clinic over at One Community Health, they had blue shirts there, and they were all peers. They were all peers that either had... Um, lived experience with mm -hmm. substance use and they had I think they were like pink shirts and they were um, HIV uh, the people that live with HIV and there was one other but they the moment that you that I walked in like someone came up to me and had a chat with me and then if depending on what it was at that time uh, when I first went in I went and went in because I had just been diagnosed with HIV so I immediately met one of the, the pink shirts and they were like, oh, well, let me take you over to this person. And then, you know, and so they like, like literally handed me off. They walked me through and handed mm -hmm. me off. And I don't think that I would have been able to stay in that clinic because I was terrified. I was newly diagnosed. Um, I was also uh, experiencing SMI, like, you know, active. At the time I was having active psychosis because it was substance uh, addiction related or stimulant related psychosis. And so I had all of these things. And so you have me go into a bright clinic with, you know, those, those lights that I swear you yeah. can hear overhead, yeah. you know, people, you know, yelling and screaming mm -hmm. or, you know, and they look different and they don't look happy and you have this whole approach and you're terrified. Um, if I didn't see, and, and I, I still recognize the people by their shirts, right? Uh, because those 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 ways of uh, that they stood out, and they were in the waiting rooms. They were out in front of the clinic, right? I don't think that I would have. I don't think that I would have had the early experiences that I had, and I may not have come back, you know. And so I do I do find value um, in peer, and that was like a mixture of you know substance use, you know, uh, behavioral health, mental health, and mm -hmm. also you know physical medical health, and so. And so, yeah, there is, I guess th that's, that's kind of like the whole thing is like, there are people that, that literally won't even try it if there's not a face that looks like them, has the experience like them, so on and so forth. Yeah. I think the, the beauty of recovery is that it's different for everybody. Mm -hmm. And so that also means that what I need in order to recover is also going to be unique to me. And I think that creates a lot of opportunity to have peer support in a lot of different places. Yeah. Right. And I think for a long time, we always, I don't want to say always, but it's like in our society, the shortcut is take a pill and you'll get better. I have a yeah. headache. Give me an ibuprofen. I have yeah. a cold. Give me a, what do we, what, do, what is that medicine? Dayquil. Dayquil, Nyquil, Theraflu, Mucinex. Like, get, you know, I'm not. We're not a commercial, I promise. No. But um, but it's like, that's our quick fix. It's like, just give me something to fix it. And 
for some people that works great. Like my sibling needs that medical model part yeah. of things, right? Um, but not everybody's gonna not everyone's gonna comply with that. Not no. everybody wants that. Um, and so it's like, well, how do you still help people when maybe they don't want that like traditional medical care? Yeah. Right. And so where are our peers? Where are our navigators? Where are our you know our um, cultural brokers? Right. So how yeah. are we? treating people in a way that aligns like with their identity, with their culture, with their preferences, mm -hmm. all that stuff. Like one of the um, things we did when we started the SAC map program um, was, you know, part of that program was to educate the community on available behavior health services, whether that be mental health or substance use. Um, and so we created this handout, which is on the website and it's, um, uh, it's like a preference and resource sheet. So the first part is like, what are your preferences? Yeah. So do you care about like the gender of the person who is oh, sure. supporting you? Do you do you care if they're like LGBTQ affirming? Sure. Do you care about like the racial ethnic like makeup of the organization or the clinic that you're going into? Do you care like all these things, right? Like yeah. what are your preferences? Because as a provider, we're so quick to throw out resources without even like, before we even look at resources, let's see what your preferences are. Mm -hmm. So then we're not like throwing things at the wall to see what sticks. We're literally like, oh, you said these particular things is what we're, you're looking for. Now, instead of throwing a hundred resources at somebody, we're like, here's 10, like yeah. here's what we were able to find. And then the second part of that sheet is, um, it's a resource sheet, but the resource sheet is what resources do you have that's gonna allow you to participate in that service? Oh, I like so that. So I think, and, and align with that, what happens a lot is we, again, we're throwing resources at people and we find out like, oh, this one's all like online. Well, they have a government phone that doesn't let them download additional apps. They right. don't have access to Wi-Fi. Um, uh, we're like, oh, go to this like support group. It's really awesome. It's over here. And then we find out, well, public transportation doesn't go there and they don't have a car. So um, it's not just about, you know, like finding all these like very specific kind of traditional services that we have, but also finding out like what is important to them. Do they actually have what they need in order to participate in that? Yeah. Um, and really like, because we don't want to send people somewhere and they're like, I can't get there. Or I walked in and this, you said this was youth friendly and it's not youth friendly or, you know, whatever that might be. Like we yeah. want to ensure that we are like, if someone's asking for support and finding their path, that we're helping them find their path, not a path. Yeah. I, um, I remember once I called Medi-Cal uh, to get therapy when I first moved here. And um, so, and I didn't have a car. I didn't, I didn't have my first car until I was like 32. Um, and, uh, and I won't tell you how long time, how long ago that was, but um, it was a long time ago. Um, but they, so they sent me out to Rio Linda and I had lived in Sacramento for three and a half months. I didn't know what a Rio or a Linda was. <laughs> And I remember taking a bus there. And after about an hour and a half, I was like, what is this place? So I get to Rio Linda, and then I have to walk another mile in. And I'm thinking, this person wants to see me every week. And I have to, I have to work. I don't even know this, this town like this. I know where I'm staying, and I know how to get to work. You know, those are the two places that I know how to get to. And... And it was, it was so unsustainable. And when I finally brought up those things of like, hey, like, I don't know this area. Um, like, I need something closer to downtown. And, you know, I need some someone who uh, is supportive of the LGBTQIA community. Um, like, you know, where, where would I find this person? And then finally, they gave me something that I, that I needed. And it turned out to be three blocks away. But what if you had like, literally like gotten on the bus that day and then been like, Oh, I've been on this bus for an hour. Uh, -uh I'm about to get off and go back. And you would have <laughs> never gotten to that, like no to that provider. And so we don't like, I think sometimes we are so used to like how our life works and what works for us and how easy certain things are. Yeah. And we forget that like, Oh, I have a car. A 20 minute appointment is going to take me an hour because I'm going to get there, got the appointment, and then I'm going to drive home. A 20 minute appointment for someone who doesn't drive is like a half a day appointment yeah, at is. least. It and is. so it's like we, you know, we're talking about recovery and, and it's person driven and it's self directed and it's all these things. It's like, but, you know, are, are we taking their whole life into perspective when we're thinking about like how do we support people in this work? And so yeah. it's just. I think, I think the hard part about 
this work and recovery and peer support is that it's like, it's not an exact science. It's not like A plus B equals C. Like it's so unique. And, you know, and that's sometimes the danger in systems is that we want everything to fit a certain way. Yes. And um, it doesn't work for Anything everybody. Anything to make it billable. <laughs> Anything to make it billable and easier. <laughs> and we can capture it all and it's measurable and we can count the digits. And the, yes. and it's like, but this isn't. It's quantifiable. It's, it's, not, it's not that kind of work. No, the human experience is completely qualitative. And so what happens is we try to fit peer support, recovery. We try to fit all of that into like these traditional models and they don't fit. Yeah. But it's like, but why are we not creating a new model and fitting those other important aspects of services and treatment into the new model? Well, I think there's money involved in there somewhere, but I don't want to call that out too loudly. <laughs> it would just take time and work, <laughs> time, is. effort, and work. I mean, we could do it. No, I think I think it's completely possible. But yeah. so then so but you know, you, you've got to think about like the, the bigger the bigger entities that the would ecosystem. Yes, <laughs> right. It was, it was pharmaceutical intervention would have a field day with yeah, that. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, you know, funding and all of that other stuff. Yeah, and I mean you have folks that have like invested hundreds of thousands of dollars their own years of their life into like a system that we're like, Oh wait, let's change it. And then we're challenging identities again, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's so, so true. It's, it's just, it's, it's a lot. It's a, it is a lot. It is a lot, but it is. I, I really do love this work. <laughs> I love the work too. I mean, I've been working, you know, I've been working in direct service for years. And I remember when I did get sober before I started working in domestic mm -hmm. violence, the one thing that I wanted to be was one of the blue shirts. I, I, I mean, I applied cause you had to, you had to have been sober for, six months and they only took people in every like six months or so yeah. and i applied and i applied and i applied and i never got to be one of the peers however in the outpatient program i got to be a co-facilitator of the outpatient groups monday wednesday and friday and just that little bit of like feeling like i had a little bit of belonging gave me the sense of ownership and like i mean that was probably one of the reasons why like I went to school, I went to school because of um, of the, the, the two the two actual like staff, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, Pamela and Donna, I went to school because of them. Like I'm finishing my doctoral degree because of all of those experiences that led mm -hmm. to me to this point. And that started with that, that want to wanting to be up here. And even though I couldn't be up here in that way, being a, a co-facilitator in these group, you know, in these, substance abuse related group sessions in their outpatient program that set me on a path of where I am now. So like it has, it has like very, very like important meaning to me. Um, I guess I don't talk about that too much, but it it's does. just wild yeah. when like you can see like a potential future from yourself just from interacting with other people who've been there. Yeah. And I mean, that's like being of service to people is like my whole life. And that's like when we do our um, our peer trainings, that you, when you ask people like, why do you want to do this training? Why do you want to do this work? It's like 90% of the time they're like, because I don't want people to go through what I went through mm -hmm. or I want someone to have like a better future or I want, it's all about the giving back. Yeah. So much that's about absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. I like that. Yeah. I don't know if this was actually supposed to turn into a, a, a podcast, but it, it, it very Surprise! much. Yeah, peekaboo. Hi again. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, it's, I, I mean, I, I think talking about recovery is so important and not just like here on a podcast, but like everywhere. Like yeah. I, and, and the more you know it, like I can like talk about recovery, like on a dime, like two seconds, tell me something. I'm like, oh, like I'm, I'm gonna tell you about the four major dimensions of recovery. I'm not going to say that, but I'm going to like, gonna, yeah. I'm going to wind it into our conversation. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, it's just, it's, it is very, I think what happened, like we don't realize how many people around us are having challenges with depression or anxiety or more serious things. And like, they don't have a space to be vulnerable and to yeah. talk about it. It's and so true. they're not able to like discover this whole like conversation around like recovery and the principles and like the major dimensions and the definition and like the hope that is out there for them. Yeah. Um, and they get, people get isolated in it. Yeah, I don't. I often wonder, you know, before before working here, I knew about the recovery model. 
I knew about peers from a lived experience standpoint of experiencing peers and connecting me with services and, and, and really kind of making me very comfortable. I, but I, I'm thinking about like, if I didn't jump into this work, if I didn't have that exposure, would I ever know that it was here? You know, and I, I, can't, I can't tell, I can't say that I would because if I, you know, like, you know, if I go to suddenly go to Kaiser, which I, you know, uh, I do, um, they don't have, they don't have that. You go, mm -hmm. you can go straight to your PCP, you tell them all of the things, and then the PCP decides whether or not you go and get a referral to psychiatry or something right. like that. But I think of some older populations who are so used to talking to their primary care that they completely like never learn that there's even, you know, like, you know, psychotherapy or any of those other mental health related services. Right. And so like all of these other things can happen, like somebody, you know, in their in their 70s might be experiencing depression, for example, and, you know, it's leaving them in brain fog and they're having short term memory loss. And so suddenly you tell a primary this and they're like, oh, well, this might be dementia. Or this might be Alzheimer's completely missing what the actual like yeah. symptomology. Maybe it is. was like depression, and part of it was because of isolation, is isolation, right. and not and having not like connection. social connection. Like, right. yeah, either living on their own right. and with limited income, and maybe not mm -hmm. having a car, mm -hmm. or maybe all of the people, like siblings and family members, are no longer around. Maybe their their children, if they have children, aren't you know. Or in the case of a lot of LGBTQIA like plus elders, maybe they don't like have family, yeah. you know, and and so. Yeah, like the importance of, of this kind of connection is um, is huge. And like I said, I don't think that I would have ever even considered recovery hadn't I had I not had you know those the, the peers there. Literally, even even though I didn't want to talk to anybody walking into this place, yeah. them literally taking me around because I was just terrified. But I still wanted help. You know, one of the wildest things to me about recovery is like if you look at the major dimensions of recovery and the guiding principles. It's all stuff everybody else has too. Like mm -hmm. um, health, home, purpose, and community. Right. Um, if you're doing mentally well, you're probably managing any health conditions. You probably have community and social support. You probably have purpose, whether it's right. like working or caregiving or like any of that. And you probably have a safe and stable place to live. Right. So it's like, yeah, you may be doing well. And part of that might be because you have those things that we are saying in order to recover, these are folks the need to have these things. And yeah. it's like we take advantage of it and don't realize like, you actually need all these things too to stay well, mm -hmm. but you don't even have to think about it because you have it. Yeah, you already. So have it, sure. you know, and I remember like one time I was um, downtown uh, with a colleague of mine, and we were walking down the street, and we happened to walk past someone who was unhoused and actively experiencing their symptoms. Yeah. And my colleague looks over to me, and she goes, "Your sister's not like that. It's got to be something else." And I looked at her, I said. She's exactly like that. What are you talking about? She just has like a house to live in and a shower and mm -hmm. food to eat. And like, I'm like, it's not that different. And it was like a light bulb moment for that person where they were like, oh my gosh. I was yeah. like, I was like, yeah, my family member just has support. Like that's the difference. That's the biggest difference. And yeah. it's like all of those things that we sometimes like, I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, especially folks who are deep in their mental health challenges, like it is really hard. Like there is a lot that has to happen and it is a journey and it, but a lot of the things people need, like they're just things everybody else has that you don't think about as being important to someone's health. Yeah. Yeah. We take that for granted. It's a, it's one of those privileges, I suppose. Um, and I've gone from, you know, me personally, I've gone from, you know, being homeless and having active, you know, um, active suicidal ideation, active psychosis, uh, active, like responding right mm -hmm. to internal stimuli uh to not having those things and so I, I i i appreciate the value of all four of them you know um yeah yeah i i think you're right i think not only like it, i it, like i can talk about recovery but from a different lens of, of of lived experience and not so much about all of the things that i'm learning in this training that mm -hmm. you know that i'm uh, that Cal Voice is putting on. Um, it's like, and, and I was, I was telling, um, you know, Danielle this, there is so much alignment of things that I know inherently that is being put together and, and formatted together in a structure. And I'm like, Oh, I know this. I know this. I've lived this. I feel yes. this. I've experienced this. Um, and I think, <laughs> 
I think that everyone, period, should be in some form of recovery because I think I think I think it would help other people relate and, and empathize um, instead of just seeing somebody who's you know experiencing homelessness and responding to internal stimuli and just saying, oh well, they chose this life or oh well, you know what I mean. I think if if everybody understood these these parts of themselves that it's related to the recovery model in general. Uh, they could see it in others, you know, yeah. easier. And I, and I'm like, I don't, I don't know how to say this the right way, but like m- mental health, mental health challenges, it's just a normal thing in my life. Like, it's not this like weird, yeah, scary yeah, yeah. thing. Sure. Like it's been a part of my life for decades at this point. Like, yeah. I'm like, oh, that, that's just the way the world works. And so like, I have a child and for me, I am trying to raise her. So this is just a normal thing, right? Yeah. Like we're at Taco Bell the other day and someone's like, going off in the Taco Bell because they're unwell. Well, they stepped outside to scream and then came back inside to eat their food. And my kid didn't even blink twice. Like she was just no. like, oh, normal day. Okay, we'll just keep doing this. And I'm like, I don't want to make a big deal out of it because I want her to know like, that, you know, people have challenges. Like we don't need to be afraid. We don't need to like think they're weird or different. Like it's just like, it's a neighbor, just like yeah. everybody else. And, and I know at some point she's going to ask me about it. And I am looking forward to that day yeah. because I mean, she's very small. That's why we haven't like had the conversation, those conversations yet. But, um, because I really want to be able to point to my family member and say, Oh, you know, that person and you love them and they love mm-hmm. you so much. And guess what? They have that too. Yeah. And look at like, Oh, because this person has like a safe and stable place to live. They have their family to support them. They have like all of these things. Um, and, and, and I also want to acknowledge that like, everybody's situation is different because you do have families that would like do everything in the possible world to like save and rescue their loved ones. So I I do understand like my situation may be different than others, but um, I just like, I just want it to be such a normal thing in my, and, and, and and the grown folks in my immediate family, like, yes, we're all like, this is a normal thing, but it's like, how do we like generationally make this, like, this is a a normal experience that people have and different people need help and here's ways we support people. And it's like, this isn't this big, scary thing. Yeah. And I think, I think a lot of social media has actually ironically helped in that, you know, uh, you know, everybody is now a mental health expert on TikTok, for example. (laughs) And, you know, even though there, there are some questionable misinformation out there, I think just the fact that people take to these, these platforms, to talk about their own wellness one way or the mm-hmm. other, even if the other Im- information may not be as as accurate, yeah. you know, talking about their wellness, like, d- and, and having that sort of um, exposure to that, like, younger generations, I think it, it, it overall helps. Um, it does. It does. I think the more you talk about it, like, it's just like anything else, like, it becomes, like, more refined. And, like, yeah. I, I feel like I've built a skill talking about recovery and mental health challenges and supporting people. I mean, I have family or friends that'll be like, can I have this person call you? And I'm like, I'm not providing services, but I'm like, (laughs) but I will like validate support and be like, and here's like a resource you may want to check out or like half the time it's just like really validating people or being like, where would I even look for this? Um, But it's, but I've, I feel like I have gotten, um, very solid in my understanding, but also very solid in like what I know I have capacity to do and what I don't have capacity to do. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think I so that. that has been, um, so I think that's made it easier for me to dive into those conversations because I'm not diving into rescue to save to any of that. Yeah. Like I'm diving in just for like general education, but you don't know that, but I know that. So like, let's have this conversation and hopefully you feel more hopeful at the end of it. And it's still good because it still provides people with the modeling of being able to go and look for mm-hmm. the, the things that fit. And uh, building the skill yeah. to go find the thing that fits for them. Yeah, exactly. And that's the important part is like we can't, we can do things with people. We can hold their hand. We can like walk with them. But when we're doing too many things for people, it's like, well, we, you just made them dependent on you and didn't really like give them like skills, tools, and all of those things for when you're not available. When is this going to be, how is this going to be sustainable? Yeah. Yeah. It's all about that. Uh, well, I guess this was a surprise podcast. I was hiding over here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, surprise. Yes, yes. I know. It's like your part three of recovery. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, it was a it was a good conversation. Yes, yes. We'll we, banter on. Yes. Yeah.